Ah, water. Hydro adventure or fluidity, fluidity, fluidity for any of you unfortunate enough to live anywhere aside from Australia or Europe is a game that I can imagine would have had a very interesting pitch meeting. So I know we're all here to try and work out what our first game should be, and I think I've had an idea. I was in the kitchen yesterday having a drink when it occurred to me, water. Holy. Sh that's the one. That's the one! So you probably know Curve Digital as the publisher for such fantastic indie games as Human Fall Flat, Oli Oli, Stick Bold, Manual Samuel, Serial Cleaners, Bomber Crew. Seriously, they've published a lot. Including the recently released Lawn Mowing Simulator, so it's clearly only up from here. Before any of that though, Curve developed some games of their own, and at the very start of all of that was Hydro Venture for the WiiWare eShop. So, WiiWare, when you think about it, is a bit of an odd breed. Spawned during a strange time between no digital downloads at all and downloadable everything except Toast. Someone get onto that, please. The Wii Shop channel was designed for cheap, small-scale, download-exclusive titles. The most exciting part of the Wii's eShop was that it allowed for smaller dev studios to easily make and distribute games using the Wii's revolutionary hardware and features without having to worry about the production costs of discs and packaging and whatnot. In theory, this was a great idea. In practice, however, it's the reason we have Sexy Poker and Pearl Harbor Simulator. I raise! Amongst the shovelware and Pearl Harbor Simulator, which, my god, how, there were a handful of legitimately great titles available for purchase, however. World of Goo, Bit Trip, all of them, Strong Bad's Cool Game for Attractive People, Tori Bash, Tales of Monkey Island, And Yet It Moves, Cave Story, Max and the Magic Marker, Art of Balance, this one which I don't quite understand, but I'm totally here for. If you've ever spent any amount of time on the Wii Shop channel, then at least one of these names should ring a bell. Anyone familiar with legitimate emotional pain, however, will know that on the 30th of January 2019, the Wii Shop channel closed for good, with all of its games being lost to time forever. Or not, I suppose, because uh, as it would turn out, a lot of WiiWare titles, including all of the ones I mentioned before, were actually given life on other platforms and are still available to play in this day and age. Maybe not with the ideal control scheme, but playable nonetheless. There were, of course, plenty of other WiiWare exclusive titles, like Bomberman Blast, Space Invaders Get Even, Monseca Corral, My Pokemon Ranch, Jet Rocket, Muscle March, or Pearl Harbor Simulator that never saw the light of day anywhere else, thank Christ. But basically all of those were just too generic or too basic to warrant any more than skimming across a 20 minute gameplay video. Amongst all of those games lost in the WiiWare ether, however, was Hydro Venture, a completely unique, full-length game that I've never seen the likes of before, available for chump change on the Wii Shop channel, and a game that I have very fond memories of. So please, allow me to gush like an open wound about one of the most interesting games I've ever played, and how much it sucks that you never will. Gush. Like water. Holy sh**, I could've made another water pun. So yeah, Hydra Venture is a physics-based Metroidvania-style puzzler where you play as everyone's favourite, tasteless, light-refractive, liquid-consumable, Blue Gator. See, everyone's looked at water in a video game before and thought, wow, that's some good looking water. But what if you could be the water? Well, that's exactly the thought process Curve Digital went through shortly after they were formed in 2005, I would assume. As exciting as it was to get completely sloshed without blacking out, the most interesting part of Hydra Venture was how playing as a liquid actually lent to creating such a unique, dynamic experience. See, Hydra Venture is a very elusive type of WiiWare game in the sense that it's a WiiWare game that actually makes deliberate use of the Wiimote's features. That's not to say other games in the eShop didn't, but most that did only use the pointer functionality, which lent themselves very well to both mobile and PC ports. Hydra Venture, on the other hand, sort of doomed itself to never be ported from the very start by heavily utilizing the other of the Wiimote's two big features, the motion controls. By holding the Wiimote like a psychopath in a hoagie, you can tilt the world of Hydra Venture at your will and control the movement of all the objects within it, including the flow of your water. Basically, the easiest way for me to explain it is if you took Loco Roco and drowned it. In theory, motion controls mean that there don't need to be any complicated control UIs or long-winded tutorials. It's all super intuitive, and it's simple enough that anyone could figure it out without even needing to be told, regardless of skill level. In hindsight, it's a very Nintendo gimmick, which I suppose Nintendo themselves realized when Curve pitched it to them back at the 2008 GDC, agreeing to publish it almost instantly. Two years later, on the 6th of December 2010, Hydra Venture was finally released in North America for a mere 1,200 points. 
points. Oh, 12 bucks for any of you human beings watching at home. And now it comes to actually playing the damn thing. And if I'm going to be totally honest, the title of this video is a little bit of a misnomer. Because technically, if you wanted to play it, you could just emulate it. However, that is not the true Hydro Venture way. Plus, I could only find North American ROMs under the Fluidity title, which doesn't technically matter. But I'm a picky f so get over it. So obviously the next step was to dig up my old Wii and find the game. To not be on my system anymore. After another short mental breakdown, I tried looking on the Wii Shop channel to discover, and pro tip, that you can actually reinstall any WiiWare titles you previously bought on that console even after the closure of the store. And after getting stuck in Chick Chick Boom for a bit, seriously, I forgot how much stupid fun that game is, I was finally ready to see if Hydra Adventure was really as good as I remembered. pretty good. So one of my biggest concerns going back to Hydra Adventure was whether or not it would even control that well. As we all know, there's a pretty negative stigma surrounding motion controls, especially with the case of a much longer, more substantial game like Hydra Adventure, as opposed to something more bite-sized like Wii Sports or 1-2 Switch. To my surprise, the controls in Hydra Adventure work swimmingly. It may all sound very stupid and gimmicky, but in practice it's astounding just how well it actually works. Admittedly, it does get a little tiring in long play sessions, and flicking the controller up to jump can get a little annoying, but in shorter bursts it works better than pretty much any other motion controlled game I've ever played. You can really tell that Hydra Adventure was built with the motion controls in mind. They weren't just slapped into place to cash in on the Wii's hardware. It was made with love, and it shows in just how refined the control scheme is. Having the ability to tilt the world as much or as little as you want at any given time allows for some really precise, methodical movements that you just couldn't get away with analog controls. As well as some really fun moments of panic where you're struggling with the Wii Wiimote, flinging it back and forth to try and keep everything balanced. It's great. The water itself works really well too, and it controls exactly as you'd want it to, flowing seamlessly over the terrain, picking up other objects in its path. Even by today's standards, seeing the water in action is genuinely very impressive. And the physics system behind it really makes you feel like you're playing as water. It's the quintessential puddle experience. Finally! Games these days, we focus on making wavy paper physics or whatever, when the real money's in water. Seriously, this is next gen. As a protagonist, a puddle of water may be incredibly powerful and pleasing to look at, but can also be very difficult to maintain control over. As you might expect, water separates quite easily, and if you aren't careful, you'll be losing a lot of it very quickly, which will lead to a very want water rapid game over. I know that one was a stress, just let me have it, please. In theory, this does mean you could split your water source and carry out two separate tasks with two separate puddles, which can be beneficial at times, but for the most part, you'll want to try and keep it together. As I mentioned earlier as well, you technically don't even control the water directly in Hydra Venture, but the world around it. Whenever you tilt your controller, the water moves, sure, but so does everything else. This can sometimes be used to your advantage if you need to roll a gear from one place to another without being able to access it just yet, or manipulate some platforms or something, but more often than not, this only makes things more complex. Thankfully though, as you progress through the game, you'll unlock a variety of abilities to make puddle life a bit easier. The first of which being a very handy pool ability, which allows you to well, pool your water for a short amount of time. This ability is especially crucial if you need to quickly regather any loose water without having to back it into a corner, and is probably the single greatest quality of life feature that makes Hydra Adventure so easy to enjoy. Less time chasing that water means more time for playing my goddamn game, is what I always say before collapsing of dehydration. On top of that, you'll also gain the ability to build and release pressure to blast away objects and another create a more directed spray to reach higher places. If you've ever made it past the first grade, however, you'll know that water is a little bit more than just water. Alongside the trusty puddle, you'll also be able to use the various checkpoints around the map to also transform into a block of ice or a steam cloud, each with their own abilities too. Alongside water, which is able to carry objects and fit through small gaps, ice can build up a ton of momentum, weigh down switches, freeze to objects and break others, while the steam cloud can float wherever it wants, electrocute enemies, harness the power of wind, and even transport water to places it couldn't normally get to through the power of rain. <clears throat> mm. 
excuse me, figuring out the capabilities and limitations of each state will be absolutely crucial, as the best puzzles are the ones which force you to use more than one. Speaking of the puzzles though, what about them? Well, you see, most puzzles tend to follow one of a few simple win conditions. The most common varieties involve transporting a gear to its mechanism to unlock a door, or returning a goldfish to its bowl. There's a few where you need to water some flowers, a couple involving the most resilient robots I've ever met, and there's even one where you have to put out a fire. At sea parks. All of these puzzles are simple enough to figure out, but still wholly gratifying whenever you do. Every time you go into a puzzle, it's usually simple enough to figure out what the solution is, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, as the real challenge typically comes from how you're going to get your water past the obstacles and over the terrain to where it needs to be. Some of my favourite puzzles, however, are the one-off ones that really weigh in on the weird. One really great one has you piling up inside a fire truck and saving an apartment full of people from horrible, painful, E-rated death. Another fantastic mission sees you helping a little man who bears a suspicious resemblance to Solid Snake to infiltrate and shut down a factory complex. Every time you complete one of these puzzles, you'll receive one, just one, rainbow drop, which you'll need to banish the evil inky influence from the book the game resides in. Because yes, there is a story. You wanna see it? Fine, here's your goddamn story. I'm invested. So yeah, collect a rainbow drop, blast away some of the influence, and get yourself one step closer to unlocking a new chapter, of which there are four in total. The mountains, the city, the ruins, and the seaside. Every time you start a new chapter, you're basically tipped right into the center of the level, and from here, you're basically free to explore the world as you please, to look for collectibles, solve puzzles, or find abilities. I mean, it's Metroid, but with water. You should be solved. By extension, each chapter spans what are essentially three pages of the book, which are further broken down into several panels, most of which act as their own standalone puzzle. The choice to break each world up in the ways that they did is pure, and I don't exaggerate when I say this, Genius. Even though there are only four worlds in this game, it feels like there's at least triple this. Each page, and further, each panel has its own unique style and personality, which keeps exploring each chapter genuinely very refreshing all throughout. Take the city for instance. While the middle page is all very city-centric, with things like houses, a basketball court, and construction sites, the moment you move over to the left page, you'll suddenly be right in the middle of a castle, with a factory on the panel even further to the left of that. Or, if you go through the right page, you'll end up in an underground bit with a bunch of flippy doors and a cable car in the panel above with the terrible, disgusting pinball puzzle that I was never able to beat a bit further up. It certainly helps that my eyes very much enjoy looking at this game, because my god if it isn't charming. The original vision for Hydroventure's art style was to base it off those old airline safety cards, before transitioning to more of an education style, based off of science textbooks with text boxes and diagrams scattered throughout the world. Eventually, the educational aspect was dropped, and we were left with this fantastic amalgamation of the two ideas that's just so damn pleasing to look at. It's basic, yet charming, and let's be real, a very smart decision to boot. I think it goes without saying, but hyper-realistic, quality-intensive games were never really the Wii's forte, so the simple art style is one of the reasons Hydro Ventures able to run at a silky smooth 60fps even with such a complex physics system in place. If my eyes were ears and hearing was looking, then I'd be a freak, but I'd also have to say that my ears enjoy looking at the music in this game, because it too is phenomenal. Throughout the world of original video game soundtracks, there's always a few tracks that naturally just sound nostalgic. For some, that might be the Wii Sports theme, or Sky Sanctuary's music from Sonic 3, maybe the credits theme from Super Mario 64, possibly even the OG Pokemon Evolution tune if you're particularly unsavory. But for me, it's every damn track in Hydro Venture. The game's only got something like 12 tracks in it, but all of them are fantastic. The music in Hydro Venture sounds like the kind of music you'd expect to hear in a game all about a puddle of water. It's all very floaty, very bubbly, very relaxing, not to mention extremely catchy. I guarantee if you spend any significant amount of time with this game, you're gonna need to get lobotomized if you want to ever enjoy any other piece of music again. That's how deeply it's gonna embed itself into your mind, especially that first chapter's middle page theme. I swear, between last playing that game and revisiting it now, I'd have that music start playing in my head randomly at least once a week, not even kidding. So, progressing through the game is pretty simple. See, in each chapter you'll find one of these purple tears in the page. Collect enough rainbow drops and the tear will open up, revealing a portal to the influencer's lair, which I promised you is not Kim Kardashian's house, because I can only assume this place actually has working sinks. Yeah. 
Instead, you'll be taken to a smaller open world area with the goal of eliminating all of the enemies to progress, using any of the abilities you've unlocked in the previous chapter. Once you've done that, the exit will open, you'll be entitled to one free rainbow drop and the next chapter will unlock. Aside from the cloud-themed finale from the third chapter, which was such an atrocity I seriously considered boycotting water, all of these boss levels are relatively simple enough to complete, and at worst will require a little bit of forward thinking to work out the optimal route. It should be noted that there aren't actually any bosses in these boss levels, not even the final one, but I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Let's be real, for a game as slow and methodical as Hydraventure, I can't even begin to conceive how a boss fight would work in the first place without being a total slog or inordinately difficult. Gather the rainbow drops, complete four Four of these boss levels and you're done. Yet yeah, to nobody's surprise, the game just sort of trickles out. No final boss, no cutscene, just a victory screen and a charming little credit sequence. For any other game, this would be sacrilege, but here, I don't mind so much. In all fairness, Zyde Adventure was never really about telling a story as much as it was about providing a memorable spin on a classic genre. Now, you could of course go back and collect the other bajillion rainbow drops, not that you get anything for doing so, but it's still worthwhile if you're wet for more. I didn't like... I didn't, I didn't like that one. You could also try and unlock the four high score based arcadey playroom mini games, Fish Frenzy, Long Jump, Gust and Pop and Trouble Tower by hunting down the 60 odd puzzle pieces hidden throughout the game. But only if you want to uninstall it 12 seconds later. Some of the puzzle pieces can honestly be very difficult to find and there's no way to keep track of how many you've collected in each chapter, which wouldn't be a problem if the fourth playroom didn't require you to find every single one, which is a shame considering it's probably the best of the lot. A single playthrough from start to finish is exactly the right length however, and its clear curve knew exactly when to end the story to satisfy casual players while still giving more serious water fans plenty to do. And that's Hydro Venture, one of the most legitimately creative, wholeheartedly charming games I've ever played that just didn't get the recognition it deserved. If I'm not mistaken, Nintendo even sent out bottles of water to a bunch of journalists to commemorate the release of the game's demo. They clearly wanted it to succeed. It's not much, but it's more than they do nowadays. Plus, what else were they going to do? Flood the IGN offices? This game took a solid five years to turn around, so the fact that this small team put in all that work only for their Nintendo published game to release with little to no fanfare before disappearing down the drain may well be the saddest part of Hydra Venture's story. And let's be real, if Nintendo wanted this game to really make a splash, then it would have. In this day and age, a Nintendo published game like Good Job can easily succeed because downloadable titles are just that much more accepted, and generally speaking, just as well promoted promoted as physical titles. In a time where physical releases saturated the market however, I'm a little surprised that Nintendo didn't end up granting Hydra Venture a retail release, especially when its control scheme basically doomed it to never leave the Wii. A downloadable console title of such quality was basically unheard of back in 2010, and to be fair, I didn't even 100% the damn thing and I still got well over 12 hours out of it. Already more time than I've invested into most physical games I own. Hydro Venture was simply just a classic case of right place, wrong time, and while it may have kickstarted one of the most prevalent modern day video game publishers, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't at least a little bit sad that most people will never truly be able to experience where it all began. Despite being lost forever though, Hydro Venture still sort of lives on in its 2012 sequel, Hydro Venture Spin Cycle for the 3DS, which I remember playing the day it released, and it's alright. It goes for a bit of a Paper Mario sticker star approach here and splits the gameplay up into a series of linear levels rather than one big open world, and I mean, it works fine. Each level is able to tell its own little story, and there's way more content here than the original, but I'll always miss exploring that vast, breathing world of the first instalment. The game also makes use of the improved 3DS gyro controls and even has a handful of levels that let you turn your system completely upside down. As cool as the idea is, it's just a little too finicky for my taste, especially in the proper actual boss fights which now exist, and just as I expected, aren't that great. While the original Hydra Venture for the Wii will always be more relaxing, more charming, and generally more groundbreaking than its sequel, I'm not at all writing off Hydra Venture Spin Cycle, and if you want to experience at least a little bit of the magic from one of the greatest hidden gems of all time, then I implore you to go check it out on the 3DS eShop before that closes down as well. As was the fate of Chibi Robo, Spin Cycle just didn't sell well enough to warrant another installment, leaving the series practically dead in the water. 
With Nintendo owning the Fluidity IP, it's unlikely we'll ever see another, as much as Curve may or may not want to, which especially hurts as if there was ever a time for a new Fluidity game, it would be now. Just imagine high quality water graphics, the best motion controls we've ever seen, and HD rumble to simulate the water sloshing around. Oh, marvellous. You know you want a Nintendo, come on, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Do it! Until that day, at least we got a trophy of the sequel's protagonist in Smash Bros Ultimate, so that's better than nothing, I suppose. I suppose. Ah yes, I know what you're wondering, and it was 11, give or take, including at least one I'm not so proud of. 27 if you count every time I said well, and 33 if you also count every time I say damn, which I think it does. After all, my pun game is watertight. 34.